Hello, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on Risk-Related Concepts, Part 1. Today I'm going to be discussing control types, and then we're going to conclude with some policies for reducing risk. And with that, let's go ahead and begin this session. Of course, I'm going to begin by talking about control types. There are three different types of controls that can be put on network resources. The first one is management controls. These are any written policy, procedure, or guideline that is used to help secure network resources against attack or abuse. Management controls are often used to define and outline other control types. They are a very broad category of controls that can include security policies, hiring policies, security awareness training, etc., etc. Then there are technical controls. These are security measures that are used in controlling access to any particular resource that is available on the network. Technical controls can include physical controls used to limit physical access to networking equipment, as in locked server room doors. Some examples of technical controls beyond the locked server room doors include encryption, firewalls, passwords, etc. And then there are operational controls. These are the procedures that are put in place to help ensure that day-to-day -day operations can occur even after a risk event has happened. Some examples of operational controls include network redundancies, hot and cold site maintenance, and backup procedures. Now it's time to talk about policies for reducing risk. Any policy that is used to help secure the workplace and or company data and networks is by default a security policy. Security policies document or outline what is allowed or not allowed to occur on the network from a security point of view. They are usually crafted at the upper layer of management with the help of knowledgeable IT personnel. In most cases, the network security policies are actually crafted by the IT personnel and then given to upper management to approve. Security policies give administrators the authority to put into place measures to protect the security of the network. In many cases, these security policies also give the administrators the authority to enforce the policies that lead to a hardened network. Now let's move on to some different policies. First up is the privacy policy. It's a policy that is used to educate employees and customers on information collection practices. Privacy policies will state why the information is collected, what information is collected, when it is collected, and how that information may be used. Many businesses now publish their privacy policies, and in some cases, privacy policies may be regulated. Then there is the Acceptable Use Policy, or AUP. It's a policy that documents what a company considers to be acceptable use of its IT assets. It may contain several sub-policies within the general AUP. The AUP should cover what is acceptable use of the internet, email, company laptops, and mobile devices. While outside threats may be difficult to deal with, the inside threat may be more dangerous to a network. It has been estimated that up to 80% of all data breaches can be traced back to a failure of security measures from within the network itself. Sometimes the breaches occur by mistake, but all too often these breaches are intentional. This implies that the greatest security threats are the people that already have been given access to the network. Policies and procedures can be put in place to reduce the risks that are associated with internal employees. Some of these policies include a least privilege policy. This is where administrators only grant the minimum amount of network privileges or access to network resources that are required to get the job done. This helps to minimize risk when an account gets compromised or in the case of a malicious network user. Then there's a separation of duties policy. Critical jobs are separated into different tasks 
with users only authorized to perform one of those tasks of the critical job. This helps to minimize the damage that can occur from fraudulent employee activities, as it would require more than one employee to take part in those fraudulent activities in order for it to be a success, and it's a whole lot harder for fraud to take place when there's more than one person involved. Then there are mandatory vacation policies. All employees should be required to take vacations, especially if they handle a critical task. This can lead to a reduction in the threat level from fraudulent employee actions. Employees know that someone else will be performing their duties in their absence and may discover any irregularities. And finally, there's job rotation. Mandatory job rotation requires that employees change job duties on a regular basis. This can lead to a reduction in the risk of fraudulent activities and has the added benefit of cross-training employees, especially for those critical tasks. Now that concludes this session on risk-related concepts, part one. I began by talking about the different control types, and then I concluded with some policies for reducing risk. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session, and I hope to do another one soon.